All right. Okay. So this week we're going to be talking about reform movements. So in your textbook reading, uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, general reform movements, right? How this couple decades before uh, the American Civil War, people were really jazzed about the idea of changing American society for the better. Exactly that looked like depends upon the group of people we're looking at, right? Um, for abolitionists, what were they looking to fix? What did they see as needing most fixing in American society? They wanted to abolish what? Do you remember what's the abolitionist goal? As you love slavery? I can't hear you on the mic. Yes, sorry. Slavery, <laughs> yes, Mary typed slavery in there. All right, good. So abolitionists saw getting rid of slavery as kind of like change number one to better American society. Um, we saw folks like the transcendentalists in an earlier chapter, right, talking about um, wanting to have Americans kind of be more in touch with themselves and nature and sort of self-discovery. So they saw improving the individual as a net benefit to American society. Um, lots of other reforms like public schools become a movement during this time period in the North. Um, we also have utopians, right? People who found utopian communities figuring that they kind of want to take a page from the Puritan playbook, right? And establish sort of the ideal perfect community so everybody else can copy it. And if you remember from your textbook reading, none of that really ends well. Um, so one of the things uh, that we're going to focus on today is another big reform movement, and that is a movement towards women's rights. Um, so all of this fever in general for reform um, during this time period that gives it an age of reform, we have to kind of remember that during this time period, the age of reform is taking place in, so the 1820s, 30s, 40s, 50s, um, women are mostly sort of being confined by this idea of the cult of domesticity, right? Do you remember, what is the cult of domesticity? Does anybody want to try defining it? I see Lavender shaking her head going, nope, don't remember that. Mary or Thomas, any, does this ring any bells, the cult of domesticity? Thomas. What is the cult of domesticity? Yes, so Thomas types, it's the idea that the women's role is in the house and taking care of the house, correct. Okay, so the idea, right, that we have separate spheres now that we have the Industrial Revolution, right, that we have kind of the private sphere or the home and that's supposed to be the dominion of women. And then we have the public sphere, right, defined by uh, work, and politics, right, and that's the man's place. So the cult of domesticity, um, it's interesting because on the face of it, you're like, okay, with women's places in the home, how can women participate in these reform movements? And how can they push for change? But remember, the cult of domesticity also assigns certain values to being a woman, including the idea that women are somehow more moral than men. So for women, even though the cult of domesticity says they should be at home, some of them participate publicly in reform movements based on that idea that women are more moral than men, right? That they have more moral authority going on. All right, so before we get into the nitty gritty, we gotta talk about the F word in the room, and that is feminism, okay? Um, this is something that a lot of people struggle with defining what it means, right? Or maybe even if you are a feminist. So I always like to straighten this out at the beginning with a quiz. All right. So we are going to find out once and for all today, if you ever were wondering whether or not you are a feminist. Now, this quiz, 
is going to be personally for your own sort of self-analysis and benefit. I am not going to be grading answers or taking answers from you. Okay, so when I when we do this quiz together, I want you to think about the answers in your head or if you want to write them down on a piece of paper, fine, but you're not sharing them with me. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. So are you ready to find out once and for all whether you are a feminist? All right, here we go. Question number one. Do you think men and women should have the same opportunities politically, socially, and economically? Okay. So question number one, do you think men and women should have the same opportunities politically, socially, and economically? Okay. Raise your hand once you've figured out what your answer to that question is and that you're ready to move on. So once you've decided whether you're answering that question, yes or no, raise your hand and I'll move on. All right, everybody's got their hands up. Now, it was a one question quiz. If you answered yes, you are a feminist. If you answered no, you are not. The reason for this is this is literally the dictionary definition of feminism. Okay, that is all feminism is. Now we can debate different flavors of feminism, right? But at its core, this is all that it is, is believing that men and women are equal and should have the same opportunities. So if you answered yes, you're a feminist. If you answered no, you're not. Okay. So any questions so far? No? All right. Now let's move on to talk. Lavender, did you have a question? No? Okay. No, sorry. I was just get trying to figure out if my hand was raised or not. I don't know what's wrong with your mic today, Lavender. Like, I see your mouth moving, but I can't hear you. Can you hear any of what I'm saying? Um, technology, man. I had an appointment yesterday, a telehealth appointment, and could barely hear the doc. So, something going on, man. All right. So, let's talk about women during this age of reform period, right? And how we get the birth of modern feminism. All right, so Thomas can hear you, but I can't hear you. Interesting. Ah, hang on. I wonder. Aha, I figured it out. Now I can hear you. You can hear me? Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it was my on my end. For whatever reason, my speakers got muted. So awesome. Thank you guys for troubleshooting. I appreciate that. Don't we love technology? Are we excited to do this again in the spring? <laughs> OK, so moving on, let's talk about how American women get from participating in reform movements in general to starting the women's rights movement in the United States. So let's talk a little bit about women participating in reform. So for women, remember at this time, can women vote? Could women vote in the 1800s? No, right? Remember, women can't vote until 1920, right? With the 19th Amendment, right? So women can't vote and they can't hold office. But women can still participate in politics by doing things like going to political debates, um, raising money for politicians they agree with, discussing politics, right, among their friends and family. Um, so women are still interested in politics. They just can't participate officially, right, through voting and holding office. Um, where women can participate a little bit more directly is in supporting petitions and political campaigns. Uh, for example, one of the first major campaigns that women participate in during this reform movement era is a campaign against the policy of Indian removal, right? Remember, this was something that was passed during Andrew Jackson's time, right, to remove uh, tribes like the Cherokee from the southeast uh, and to relocate them to Oklahoma, what was then known as Indian Territory. 
Uh, and um, women said, no, that's not fair. You're kicking them off their land, right? And so a lot of women actually wrote to Congress and said, we don't agree with this, okay? Now, besides that, there are other causes that tend to draw female activists to them. Uh, abolition of slavery is a major one, and that's actually going to be the movement that's most closely linked with feminism. Uh, the temperance movement, does anybody know what the temperance movement is? Anybody remember? I don't know that we've talked about it too much in class. So it's kind of tricky because temperance as a word means moderation, right? To temper something means to moderate something. The temperance movement is about alcohol. So initially the temperance movement starts as wanting to get Americans to drink less, to moderate their alcohol consumption. But by the time we get to the age of the reform, the temperance movement is now going to move into more wanting to ban the consumption of alcohol, right? Uh, and for women, a lot of them identified with the temperance movement because they saw the negative effects of alcohol on the family, right? That um, husbands would spend money drinking, right? Rather than you know paying rent or putting food on the table or that drunk husbands would, uh, beat their wives and kids, which was totally legal at this time, so long as they didn't do excessive damage. Um, so for many women, they saw this as a, a women's issue, it was something that affected women. Uh, and then how we treat the mentally ill. This was another movement that really attracted female reformers. So women, these are kind of the movements, the reform movements that women cluster to, but it's not an exhaustive list. Okay. All right, so when we're talking about women's participation in reform movements, we've got a couple of big names that we should mention. Uh, Catherine Beecher um, was one of the major organizers to campaign against Indian removal. Uh, you may be more familiar with her sister, Harriet Beecher Stowe, um, who also initially uh, began her sort of political involvement with, uh, with her sister, campaigning against uh, removal of tribes like the Cherokee, um, but she's more known for the abolition movement in part because of a book that she writes. Does anybody know what book Harriet Beecher Stowe writes? Becomes a bestseller in 1851. Some of you may have read it. I'm going to... She writes a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin which is basically um, a sort of fictionalized account of a uh, slave's life and attempt to escape slavery. So it, she wrote it to kind of get people to sort of sympathize with fictional characters uh, and their plight with slavery. Uh, and uh, her novel actually becomes a huge hit in the North. Uh, and uh, overshadows some slaves publishing their own biography, autobiographies and narratives of their escape from slavery. Dorothea Dix, who is the one pictured on this slide, uh, becomes famous for campaigning for more humane treatment for mentally ill people. Uh, at this time, if you suffered from a mental illness, um, there wasn't a whole lot of research into the causes of mental illness or how to treat them. Um, most of the time, families. Oh, you think that, huh, Mateo? Uh, most of the time, families uh, would try to, as their best to take care of their mentally ill loved ones at home. Um, for people who suffered from more severe mental illness or were disruptive, the solution was to put them in jail, right? And have the state basically deal with that. And none of that involved actually treating. The mental illness, just kind of trying to manage it. Um, and Dorothea Dix said that is not the way to treat people. Like you don't toss them into jail because they have a mental illness. Jail is a place for people, jail and prison are places for people who've broken the law, not people who ha are suffering. Uh, and so she uh, campaigned to establish insane asylums where the mentally ill could receive specialized treatment. Um, and so for this reason, 
uh, you will find a lot of mental health facilities named after Dorothea Dix today. Um, her campaign uh, to revolutionize how we treat the mentally ill uh, is successful. And uh, by the time we get hit to the Civil War, about 28 states had established mental hospitals, thanks to efforts by her. So now, would you necessarily want to, in comparison to today, be in one of those mental hospitals? Probably not. It's going to take a while uh, for us to understand mental illness. We're still trying to understand mental illness, um, but certainly an improvement. Um, then there's the Female Moral Reform Society. This is an example of a group. This group was originally founded in New York City by middle class women and subsequent chapters pop up uh, in other cities across the United States. And for the New York City group, they sought to reform and rehabilitate sex workers. Um, they saw the existence of prostitution. Hang on, let me punt Mateo outside. Um, they saw the existence of prostitution as, come on, out, out, as kind of threatening the value of all women, but especially single women. Um, and so their logic was that if we can end prostitution, we restore respectability to all women. Uh, and what's unusual here is that typically during, especially during this time period, when we're talking about prostitution, there's a lot of blaming of prostitutes. But they don't engage in slut shaming in this group. Instead, what they do is to they want to genuinely help women transition out of sex work uh, and uh, do t jobs training and find them places to stay, etc. But they also uh, take to shaming their clients. So these ladies publish the names of their prostitutes, uh, friends, frequent male clients, including ministers and politicians in newspapers to out them. Um, so again, this is kind of a refreshing take because for most of the time we're talking about prostitution being evil, there's a lot of blame laid on the prostitutes and not the people who frequent them. So many similar groups pop up across the United States using similar tactics and focusing on other issues they saw as essential to women, like for example, wanting to ban the consumption of alcohol. Now, um, women and free speech. Remember, women are supposed to, according to the cult of domesticity, stay at home. So the idea of women speaking out in public about reform mo movements, especially to audiences of mixed genders, was seen as women intruding on public space, that they didn't belong there. It was one thing if women were speaking to an audience of exclusively other women, but the minute they're also talking to like men, then they're, they're seen as, as out of place, right? Um, women who spoke in public um, not only were seen as out of their element, but they were also seen as going against what a good woman was supposed to be like. Because remember, gender roles say women are supposed to, at this time, say women are supposed to be meek and delicate and submissive. And if you're a woman speaking out in public, you don't come across this way. Uh, so many women actually fight back against this notion that they can't speak out in public, that it's improper for them to do so. Um, Maria Stewart, for example, is an African-American woman living in Boston. Um, and she said, look, if the First Amendment grants freedom of speech to all citizens, women are citizens, even if we can't vote. Therefore, we also enjoy freedom of speech. Uh, and she successfully spoke in public in Boston in 1832, but the criticism was so intense that she was actually forced out of Boston in 1833. Um, a pair of sisters pictured here, Angelina Grimke and Sarah Grimke, uh, were probably the most effective uh, speakers and, and, and sort of critiques uh, of this system that slammed women for speaking. The Grimke sisters are really interesting. They are actually from South Carolina. So your textbook mentions that most reform movements during this time period are centered in the North. But here we have two women from South Carolina um, who are activists. Uh, they actually were born and raised on a plantation. So their dad was the plantation owner. Um, and they both didn't like slavery. Um, Sarah, for example, had even taught her personal slave how to read. 
when she was growing up. And when her dad found out, he uh, uh, wanted to beat the slave as punishment because it was against the law, right, for Sarah to have taught uh, her slave uh, to read. And the sisters went up north uh, for education. Uh, they both became Quakers. And then they began uh, speaking out against the evils of slavery, drawing on their personal experience uh, growing up the daughters of a plantation owner. The more people protested women speaking out in public, the more the Grimke speak sisters speak out in public. Uh, and the more they realize that a lot of the rights that they're talking about being denied to African Americans are also rights being denied to women. So this is part of the reason why the Grimke sisters are sort of seen as the mothers of the women's rights movement in the United States, because they're the first to explicitly link abolition and women's rights and recognize that women and, and slaves have a lot in common. All right, so the Grimke sisters and other women who were participating in the abolitionist uh, movement started to see that a lot of the rights denied to slaves were also rights denied to women. Uh, and the experience that these activists had gained speaking out against slavery could now be applied to them speaking out for women's rights. Uh, the Grimke sisters were the earliest advocates to explicitly connect abolition and feminism. And that didn't necessarily go over well. Um, for example, your textbook in this chapter actually has uh, an exchange of letters between Catherine Beecher and Sarah Grimke. Catherine Beecher basically told Sarah Grimke uh, she was giving women a bad name by speaking up. Sarah Grimke replies, I know nothing of men's rights and women's rights. My doctrine then is whatever is morally right for a man to do, it is morally right for a woman to do. So there were women within these reform movements who were not okay with the women's rights movement. Um, and so when you look at your textbook for this chapter, really look at Catherine Beecher's letter and you'll kind of understand some of the criticisms uh, of women against the women's rights movement during this time period. Sarah Grimke publishes letters on the equality of the sexes in 1838. Um, when you read that, uh, it raises issues that still uh, concern modern feminists, including the idea uh, of equal pay not being realized yet. Uh, and the Grimke sisters lay the groundwork for the women's rights movement with their writings, but then they retire from speaking. Um, both women get married, one of them to uh, noted abolitionist uh, Thomas Weld, uh, and they decide that they just want to kind of move on. Uh, to their private life. So their torch is picked up by other women. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott have a similar experience as the Grimke sisters do in transitioning from abolition to women's rights. Um, both of them were very diehard abolitionists. Um, they both were selected uh, to go to this uh, World Anti-Slavery Convention in London uh, in 1840 as delegates representing American abolitionists. They travel all the way to London. They get to the meeting only to be turned away because they're women. So at that point, they go, uh, we have a problem here. Uh, and they need to turn their energies and attentions towards women's rights. Stanton and Mott are going to be two of the main organizers of the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, kind of considered ground zero of American feminism. So this meeting uh, is called all of these different activists, both men and women, uh, who have been speaking uh, about women's rights. And they publish the Declaration of Sentiments, which is a riff off of the Declaration of Independence. Um, women replace the, they replace the part where there's a list of grievances in the Declaration of Independence against the British with a list of grievances that women have. Uh, about how women are treated in the legal system in the United States. It's going to be the Seneca Falls Convention that identifies women not having the right to vote as priority number one, as the number one problem that needed to be fixed. Um, this is the first time we have an artic official articulation by any group in that we want to get 
women the right to vote. Um, why do you think they focused on voting as the most important of all the concerns that women had? Why voting? Yes, Lavender. Once they had the right to vote, then they could start uh, getting changed in other areas because they could vote for them. Right, because remember, when we talked about the expansion of democracy, right, and more men voting, regardless of whether they own property or not, the argument was you make change through your vote, right? So women see voting as the key stepping stone to making changes in other areas, okay? Um, Lydia Maria Child, who's one of the activists at this meeting, says either the theory of our government, by which she is referring to democratic principles and equality, Either the theory of our government is false or women have the right to vote. So here she's kind of calling out that all men are created equal. And she says, this doesn't mean like men, men. This means mankind, right? It's inclusive of women. So the women's issues kind of identified at this point fell into three different groups at the Seneca Falls Convention. The sort of priority number one is suffrage or the right to vote and legal status of women. The second kind of category is women's access to education and employment. And then the third category is women's equality and role within the family, okay? Which is always the hardest to talk about because you're talking about people's personal lives. So again, these women kind of lean on gender roles and stereotypes at this time to argue that because by the standards of the time, women are conceived as more moral than men to say that they would be better voters and better politicians because they're more moral. Okay, so they're, again, at this point, they want to push against gender norms, but they also want to take those gender norms and try to argue to their advantage using them. So, when it comes to women and freedom, what women define as important really is going to be measured by their social class. Um, for middle class women, um, middle class women have probably the biggest gains due to the Industrial Revolution. Um, remember, the increase in technology and the rise of wealth enabling the growth of this middle class allows these women to be able to afford servants who are doing the household work and that frees up her time, right? She has more downtime, more free time, but not a whole lot of things that she can do with that free time, okay? Um, so middle-class women like Margaret Fuller pictured here and what looks like it should be a, a copy for a Beats ad with her ha hairstyle, right? Looks like she should be wearing headphones. Um, Margaret Fuller, and others argued that if women were going to be truly free, they needed to have the same opportunity for self-realization and improvement as men did. So it's no accident here that Margaret Fuller is part of this transcendentalist movement, right? That's focused on sort of self-discovery and self-improvement as key to freedom. Um, Margaret Fuller is one of the more prominent female members of the transcendentalist movement. Uh, she, her father recognized the genius uh, of her at a young age and actually gave her a classical education at home that was more typical for a boy uh, to receive. She actually served as an editor at various publications, including the first female uh, literary editor at the New York Tribune. And she writes uh, an essay called Women in the 19th Century, in which she argues that women should have equal opportunity for fulfillment, for personal fulfillment exploration. Uh, sadly, Fuller uh, dies uh, in a uh, shipwreck with her husband and small child. So her life is cut short at age 40. Now, self-fulfillment's all good for middle-class women, but working-class women, lower-class women are trying to survive. Uh, for them, work is not, or, or stuff outside the home is not so much about personal fulfillment as it is for survival. Um, working class women, remember, often have to work to help the family survive. So for them, they're focused more on work and access to things like equal pay or better job opportunities so they can better help their family. 
economically, not so that they can feel fulfilled. But this means challenging uh, notions of women being too delicate, right? That women were these delicate flowers. Um, Sonja Truth is probably, who's pictured here, uh, is probably the most famous of these early uh, women's rights activists who really focuses on the working class and on uh, women in the workplace. Um, Truth was a former slave uh, who had attained her freedom. Uh, she really always tried to center the experience of working class women and women of color in her activism. And she gives this very famous uh, extemporaneous speech called Ain't I a Woman in 1851. Um, unfortunately, because she was uh, an extemporaneous speaker, and if you have not taken public speaking yet, extemporaneous means kind of like off the cuff, right? So because that was her style of speech giving, she didn't write stuff down, right? She didn't, you know, prepare it formally ahead of time. And so we don't have a full transcript of that speech. We just kind of have snatches of what people remembered um, while listening to that speech. But at one point in this speech, she does basically talk about how, you know, uh, she has worked all these very demanding physical labor jobs when she was enslaved. Um, at one point she actually flexes her biceps, right? Uh, to demonstrate her strength, but she still says, ain't I a woman, right? Despite all this stuff, this, despite, you know, me working all this, I'm still clearly a woman. Um, women like Sondra Truth saw women working outside the home as necessary uh, for not only economic survival, but also for women to be free from men. Because they saw so long as women were dependent upon a man for a paycheck to support her, she couldn't ever be truly free. Um, some women kind of took this uh, freedom to also mean sort of literal physical freedom um, by talking about women's fashion. So what were women dressing like at this time? Does anybody know what's the style? What are women wearing before the Civil War? Anybody up on historical fashion? Lavender. I mean, I don't know exactly, but from what I do know, like lots, like long dresses, long sleeves, lots of clothing, lots of layers, lots of general, yes. lots of, lots of clothing, lots of stuff. Right now, imagine moving in long layers and lots of layers and skirts. And also the fact that hoop skirts and bustles are big. So if you're not familiar with a hoop skirt, um, basically you're wearing a metal cage around your waist to make your skirts look fuller, right? Or a bustle is kind of like a giving yourself a more predominant booty, right? But same kind of thing, like a metal framework. Imagine moving around in all of that. Imagine trying to sit or do normal work and things like that. So some women are like, even our fashion is oppressive. And so this is where some women begin to adopt uh, bloomers. Um, the closest thing <clears throat> I can compare bloomers to is like um, uh, hammer pants. If you're familiar, you guys are probably too young for MC Hammer, uh, but like really loose baggy pants, right? Um, with the idea that that gave more, women more freedom. Not only do we have hoop skirts on the bottom, right, which are these very unwieldy contraptions, but bras have not been invented yet. So how are you securing the girls? What are you wearing up top? Anybody know? You are wearing corsets. Okay. So again, very sort of rigid. You usually have boning. Whalebone was popular. So these kind of vertical lines of boning and you be laced into this. And this the fashion is a very tiny waist. So literally corsets would actually rearrange when you wore it long enough, rearrange where your organs were sitting inside because of how they were cinched. Yeah, okay. Um, there's a reason, like some people today still wear corsets and enjoy wearing corsets, um, but there's definitely a reason that if you ever wanna try switching to corsets on a regular basis, you start, 
with kind of like a trainer corset and you work your way smaller. Um, because again, like it does have profound implication for your innards. So again, the, the argument that women, and basically women would want to go as small as possible. So there's a reason why like the fainting couch is a very popular piece of furniture at this time, right? So if you passed out from lack of oxygen because your corset was too tight, right? You could just flop onto this, this piece of furniture. All right, so women face challenges, not only social challenges, but also even physical challenges with their clothing. Um, they're gonna have to work to extend basic freedom to women, but also push against those social conventions okay, and gender roles. Now, what's really sticky is when we talk about women's rights in the home, in the private sphere, um, because what people do at home it's private, right? Like we have, even though there's nothing in the constitution that says we have a right to privacy, uh, a lot of people kind of expect that it's there. And a lot of Supreme Court law, especially from the 1960s forward, currently gives us a sense of privacy. Okay, when we talk about history 1302, um, we talk about the case of Griswold v. Connecticut as being a really important one in, in this idea that we have a right to privacy in our homes. Um, that case was specifically about birth control. So we'll leave that for history 1302. Um, but at this point in time, women had to kind of address what was possible to change. And for a lot of women, even though they noted that there were many problems that women suffered at home and this imbalance of a relationship with the men in their lives, that's very difficult to tackle. Um, some feminists went so far as to equate marriage with slavery, um, a little bit hyperbolic, but remember in the legal system at this time, when women were married, remember they didn't have independent legal status, right? They couldn't own property. They couldn't bring a case uh, in a court of law. If they worked outside the home, they didn't even have control of the money they made that automatically went to their husbands. Um, custody of their kids uh, automatically was granted to their husbands. So women really don't exist as independent legal entities if they're married. Um, so they're effectively seen as property of their husbands. Uh, and that's part of where the tradition um, of women changing their name when they get married to their husband's name comes from. Uh, it comes from the old English practice called coverture, which basically meant that the woman was the possession of the husband when she got married. Um, English feminist Mary Wollstonecraft had made a similar argument about women effectively being property and slaves uh, in the institution of marriage in her writings in the late 1700s. You may not be familiar with Mary Wollstonecraft, but I guarantee you, you're familiar with her daughter, whose name is Mary Shelley. Anybody know what Mary Shelley's claim to fame is? We just had Halloween. What is Mary Shelley famous for writing? Anybody know? Frankenstein. Okay. So women's legal status within marriage was something that women were really focusing on. Um, some states actually moved to pass laws to address women's status. Uh, for example, uh, some states start passing laws that say women have right to property acquired during a marriage. Um, most of this is done in a way to protect, not so much for women's independence, but to protect families from financial ruin if the husband lost their job or their wealth or abandoned them. Um, there's also the fact that women don't have bodily autonomy within marriage at this time. Um, men had full rights uh, to their wives' bodies. Um, no such thing as rape existed in marriage at this time. Uh, in fact, uh, marital rape will not be outlawed in all 50 states until the early 1990s. Um, men also were allowed to beat their wives and their children so long as they did not do excessive damage. So if they severely injured or killed them, they could be prosecuted, but otherwise no. Uh, and the fact that women could not reject sex 
uh, often meant women were concerned about what? They can't say no to their husbands. What are they going to be concerned about? What's the natural consequence of sex? Babies, pregnancy. Okay. Um, women don't really have uh, a whole lot of options at this time uh, for family planning. Um, for I mean, there are there are things that exist, right? There are. Um, sort of what we would call natural methods of birth control. So the rhythm method, which is uh, only having sex when you're not fertile, right? So track that realizing you tracking your cycle and your cycle being predictable and regular, which it isn't for a lot of people. Um, or God forbid the pullout method, which is not very effective. Um, there are condoms at this time, although they're not uh, like modern condoms. They're not mass manufactured and made of rubber or latex like they are today. Condoms during this time period are made of animal intestines. So if you get like sheepskin condoms, for example, today, those are still made from animal intestines. Um, so there are birth control methods that exist, but they're not widely available um, or information about it is not widely available either. Um, so for many women, pregnancy is... Um, a serious condition. It's especially if you have kids really close together, then that increases the odds of maternal uh, and infant mortality, right, of dying in childbirth. Um, and so for a lot of women, um, this was a big problem. Uh, Margaret Sanger, who is the founder of Planned Parenthood, was the middle of 11 surviving kids um, her mom was pregnant 18 times in 20 years. Um, so that kind of shaped Margaret Singer's, uh, views about access to birth control and, and family planning. Um, and that's more of a story for history 1302. Um, but definitely for women, um, child pregnancy and childbirth was a risky business medically. Um, even today, uh, Texas has one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the United States, despite all of our advances in medicine. Um, so imagine how it was 150 years ago. So for women, um, because they didn't have rights over their body or rights to property or legal rights within marriage, for some women, they kind of reacted to this by saying, we're just never going to get married. So like Susan B. Anthony, never married. Um, she did not see, well, first of all, uh, lots of evidence suggests that she was queer, uh, that she liked other ladies. Um, but second of all, like she always said, look, I don't see how it's possible to maintain the same level of freedom I enjoy as a single woman when I'm married. Um, other women like Lucy Stone say, well, I'm going to focus on a more sort of equal marriage. So Lucy Stone and her husband, who was also a reformer, uh, kind of created their own definition of a more equal marriage that would look kind of more like our modern conceptions of marriage. Um, so her husband was Henry Blackwell. Um, but for a lot of women, they said, look, like this is a touchy area uh, to talk about things like sex and your relationship with your spouse. Um, and so there was this thought process that if we focus on this, we're not going to have a whole lot of popularity. That voting is far easier of a sell than talking about sex. So this is part of the reason why for this kind of what we call the first wave of feminism in the United States, that's why we're going to focus on voting first. Okay. Uh, to wrap up, I'm going to bring it full circle back to talking about women and abolition. Uh, so the abolitionist movement and female activists in the abolitionist movement give birth to the women's rights movement. And they do get a lot of support from other abolitionists. For example, Frederick Douglass, a very famous abolitionist, was also part of the women's rights movement. Um, however, not every uh, male abolitionist was down with uh, women having more rights. In particular, the abolitionist movement actually splits 
1840 over the role of women. Uh, Abby Kelly was named to a position of leadership in the American Anti-Slavery Society. And when she was named into a position of leadership, that upset a lot of men who, like Catherine Beecher had argued, um, that these women were violating gender roles by speaking up and that it distracted women from performing their domestic duties by being activists. Other abolitionists said, look, if we more publicly embrace the role of women, that's going to turn off a lot of more conservative men uh, to the ideas of abolition. So they saw this as dam uh, damaging their ability to sell abolition. Um, similarly, this kind of section of abolitionists also said that William Lloyd Garrison, who ran uh, the Liberator paper, was also kind of extreme and that they should distance themselves from him, too. So what ends up happening is the more conservative abolitionists who were not down with feminism um, formed the Liberty Party with a goal to elect abolitionist officials to office so that they could get rid of slavery. Uh, in the election of 1840, the Liberty Party didn't do very well. They only got about 0.03% of the vote. However, that's not the last we're going to hear about the Liberty Party. As you're going to read, they actually do play a role in a future election as a third party. So the legacy of feminism and abolition is that feminism grows out of the abolitionist movement, right? When women realize that they also are lacking a lot of the same rights that slaves are, are uh, lacking as well. But... While this is going to kind of be the watershed mark for the abolitionist movement, by 1840, there's not many people who haven't already made up their mind on the issue of abolishing slavery. This is just going to be the beginning for the women's rights movement in the United States. It's going to continue to push and to grow. It's going to see some growing pains after the Civil War, which we're going to talk about at the end of the semester. Um, but definitely, like, that's the movement that's poised for more change and growth at this, this juncture in 1840s, the women's rights movement. Any questions? That's a very quick snapshot of the first part of wave one of feminism. Everybody's just dazed because we're still waiting on election results today. Same. All right, let me go ahead and stop the recording now. <laughs>